Hello. Hello. Hi, come on. What's going on? Doing all right. I am Breeshin. I will make that clear. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. It was in the it was in the junk folder. <laughs> the oh, was it? Was it? Okay. Okay. Yep. So. Yep. Um. Oh, that that's good to know. It may be a good idea then. Um. It may be a good idea to to uh, remind everyone uh, that it might be in spam. Yeah. Yeah, may very well be there. But you um you uh look and sound fine. Um, Great. Uh, feel free to uh, um um bump your uh um uh, uh your volume if you can. Can can you hear me now, or is this a good speaking volume? Yes, that that that's better. That's better. Probably just distance from the mic. Okay, then I'll I'll bring it in a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, this is just a check in. So from here, uh, feel good. Uh, feel free to uh, um, uh, mute and go off camera until we're ready to uh start. Great. Um, uh, we'll start with Cherry. And uh, um, Ryan, Ryan will introduce the webinar, and Cherry will introduce each of each of you. And so, once you're introduced, you can come on camera and unmute. Okay, great. That sounds All right. good. All right, thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah, appreciate it. Yep. Oh, by the way, your headshot with the little keyboard—that is, that's a great picture. I love that picture. That was from like seven years ago. That's actually on my business. I have a business card with that on the back of it. Nice. So, I, I it was I was doing the anime thing. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank yeah. you, man. No problem.
Hello, David. I'm pretty sure you just shut How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Am I the first one? I'm usually the early bird. Um, Mike Bond um, showed up before you did, and he looked and sounded fine. So okay. um, I told him to uh, 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 feel free to mute and go off camera until we're ready to start. Cool. Um, Oh great! I love I love your virtual background. That's nice. Yeah, unfortunately, my ca my computer's old, so the camera is not great. But you know, I guess it does enough. You can see, like, I'll disappear. My arm will. <laughs> oh yeah, Fine. yeah, yeah. Th that that happens. That happens with a lot of virtual backgrounds. Like with me, it, it'll I'm blurred right now, so that'll yeah yeah that'll, yeah. Um, but but you look and sound uh fine. Um, okay, cool. So you're good to go. Uh, awesome. We'll start with just once we're in a practice session now. So once okay. uh, once um, everybody is joined, we'll start with just uh, Cherry and Ryan. Ryan will okay. introduce the dialogue, um, and then Cherry will introduce each of you. And okay. we will uh, and, and when you're introduced, you can you can show up. You know, you could come on camera. Oof. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, cool. Okay, sounds good. Cool, man. All right. Thanks. Sure. Hello, Preston. Hello. How are you? Nice to nice to finally meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Ryan Ryan speaks at you at uh, speaks about you at Lake Uh oh, great things to say. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> uh, and 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 again, your the, the jacket in your headshot, that shirt, your you've got some style. I, I like that. I like those colors. I, I guess it comes to the territory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, cool. Well, you look and um, 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 and sound fine. Um, uh, be sure to uh, you, you could scoot in a little closer to your mic uh, just so we pick you up a little better. But uh, okay. yep, is this better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, that should be good. Um, um, but we're just waiting for everybody to roll in. Um, um, we, uh, two panelists show, um, showed up before you. And so we'll start with just Ryan and Cherry and, uh, Ryan will introduce the, the dialogue and Cherry will introduce each panelist. And once you're introduced, you can come on camera and unmute, uh, um, um, do, uh, do note in the chat, you can chat just with the, the host and panelists or with the whole audience. So make sure you're on host and panelists unless you want to tell the audience something. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks for doing this. We're glad to have you. Yes, I, I told her, I said, now you know how to, this ain't my wheelhouse, but you know. She's like, well, I think you do have some, you know, some very interesting things to say as it relates to music education. I said, okay, well, I can talk about that, so. Yeah, yeah, and this is just to give, this is just to kind of introduce um, um, our audience to uh, uh, to the topics in general, so they don't have to be all this. We've got enough panelists to handle specifics, and so it's just we want a diverse amount of voices, you know. So, so, so y y your background and experience is just as valid. Oh, okay, well, all right. As long as y'all happy with it, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm excited about the show, though. And now that I, I've I've moved to downtown Trenton, so I live. So actually, Mill Hill. I live in Mill Hill. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, the passage way is like right there, like like I walk outside and I just then that's Patches Theater. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you're right around the corner. Awesome. Awesome. Literally, like yeah, I can. And I, I ran into Ryan. I was running, and she was running, and she was on her way to work. And I was like, oh yeah, I live right here. She's like, well, you know, Patchouli is right there. And I was like, yeah, I I, I made the connection now because the first time I went, I got lost. So no, oh, sure, sure. 
Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 So, so yeah, we, we want to make sure you get some tickets reserved. Sure. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. And it's shaping up into a good show. The, the team is really, is really gelling. So, um, so uh, we're pleased. We're pleased. I think, I think it's yeah. going to be a good one. I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, 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 you're good. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just hanging out until everybody shows up and we'll start in about 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Hey, Ryan. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes. Uh, so the audience won't see it yet. Um, the audience won't see it yet because we're still waiting for all the panelists. So it'll, it'll it's just a, a, a practice session. It's still in practice session. Uh, hmm. Okay. Okay. So I have some panelists already on, so they must have joined the, um, some people must have joined the, uh, audience link. So just a moment. Oh, um, I did that update with my iPhone and now it merges <laughs> onto my laptop and I don't know how to make it stop. So I do apologize. I'm going to try to figure out how to make that stop. Okay. But my first question that I would have for each of you is, um, can you talk about how did you come to, to, how did you come to jazz? How did you come to love jazz? <laughs> Uh, for me, um, it started in high school. Um, I went to Trent Trenton Central High School from uh, 1972 to 1975. And to my surprise, my high school music teacher was Tommy Grace, the younger brother of Gigi Grace, who um, recorded with Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk. And he was also one of the first black musicians to break into the movie business. But um, I didn't know all this until I was a senior in high school. And I discovered it by accident. And I asked Mr. Grice, was Gigi Grice his brother? And he told me, yes, he was. And um, that kind of got me started being, you know, interested in, in the art of jazz. Um, then when I went to college, I met up with a few of Grice's friends, um, Jimmy Anderson, a saxophone player who went to high school with Wayne Shorter and was also Woody Shaw's theory teacher. And um, Bill Phipps, his brother Nat Phipps, um, started Wayne Shorter's music career. He was Wayne, he was Wayne Shorter's first professional experience. Um, after college, 
I met up with Frank Foster, and ironically, Frank Foster and Grace went to high. I mean, went to college together, and um, that's when things really took off for me. You know, working with Frank Foster, Abdullah Ibrahim. I sat in with the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, big band once. Um, and of course, I crossed over, played with Angela Bofield. Um, um, I'm trying to remember so many people, <laughs> but um, it was a cross section of people over time. Oh yeah, the, um, the Dells, the Temptations, Valerie Simpson, People just like that. Folks from around the way, just like a couple. Of sort of, yeah. Just them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, so thank, thank you. How about you, Mike? Well, first, I got to give a shout out to one of my musical fathers, which is James Stewart, right here. Oh. <laughs> puts, puts me on the gig every now. <laughs> um. I fell in love with this, well, out of out of classical music, because I started, yes, I started when I was young. Um, I had a strict piano teacher, and I didn't realize from age four to 10, when I was studying piano, that music was actually a self-expression sort of thing, where I can celebrate um, humanity through music. I thought I was just following the directions of grown-ups and being terrified uh, while doing so, playing at Carnegie Hall and like whatever, I was just trying to earn my Game Boy games, whatever I had to do <laughs> to keep my parents happy and my teacher happy. Right. Um, it wasn't until I quit that I discovered romantic classical music like Chopin and new words like rubato, meaning I could manipulate the time and do things on my own. And then by the time I was in middle school, they were looking for a, a, a pianist to play in the jazz band. And I did not make the audition. Um, and, uh, and that kind of bummed me out. But I was encouraged to study with uh, a great pianist in the area who was living in Hamilton at the time. Uh, his name's Jim Riddle. And Jim introduced me to, um, to everyone. You know, Jim introduced me to Oscar Peterson, We Get Requests, was my first record that I heard. And then from then on, it's like McCoy and Herbie and, Bud Powell and, you know, and then it was Stanley Cowell who has a long history playing with, you know, Max Roach and the Heath brothers, you know, um, in college. And so I, I started developing mentorship and understanding that just like the blues, uh, this music is really one uh, that's passed down uh, through storytelling, it's passed down by mentorship. And I was lucky to have those mentors and I still am lucky enough to play with them uh, today, so. Thank you. Dr. Wilson. Um, so my uh, uh, first encounter with jazz was listening to uh, my father who would listen to jazz all the time. Um, and he was the only one in the house that would listen to it. And um, <laughs> So I'll just hear, hear him talking about um, various names. But when I was exposed to it as, you know, playing it was through church. Um, so I started music in church and gospel music is really an amalgamation of a lot of different styles. And um, I, uh, I played the organ at church and then I started playing the piano um, or keyboard rather. And I just had a lot of jazz influence um, not really knowing what it was. I was just like, well, that's just what we do at church. And um, and that was really my, my my first encounter with actually playing jazz. And then um, as I went to college, um, you know, I would, you know, work at some of the clubs and, you know, I was just like, give me the fake book and I'll play through it or whatever. And um, I played with the, the jazz band on campus, but I just, it wasn't really jazz. I mean, I was like, oh, this is just, music that's not classical <laughs> and it and it was more fun for me to do than classical so i was like it's fine that, this is fine with me um so that that's that's my experience with it david 
Well, I just want to make clear that I'm the one panelist who does not play an instrument. Um, <laughs> and so I, I admire um, those who can play instruments. I, my mother would always kind of link me up with great uh, instruments, but ones that I just was not adept at playing. So I think at some point I tried the trombone. Uh, and then at another time I tried the accordion. And it just didn't really work. But I always had kind of a good ear, I think, particularly for dialogue. That's why I write plays. Um, but you know, our house was kind of a, a folk house and a jazz house. So my mom would always play those kinds of records and she'd tell me stories about going down when she was a younger woman to see uh, people like Nina Simone in Atlantic City and uh, just a lot of different jazz artists. So from a young age, I was exposed to jazz and became something I, I grew to love. Um, I listened to WRTI a lot when I was younger uh, as a Temple student. Um, and um, that's kind of how I was first exposed to it. But I'm kind of omnivorous. So I like all kinds of music. And uh, but jazz and blues are right up there for me um, as, as a couple of my favorites. All right, since we've got multiple of you with lived experience and some of you that teach folks like myself, I am dying to know, what is the difference between jazz and blues? Well, um, you know, historically, blues came along first, um, due in part to slavery, but um, at the dawn of the 20th century, I would say around the 1890s, um, those musicians that were around during that time were interested in classical music. So they took what they heard from classical music and it evolved into jazz because jazz is actually a combination of blues and classical music because of its level of sophistication. A lot of people, you know, a lot of really discerning musicians know this because some of the phrases that they play come from classical um, suites and etudes or whatever you want to call it. It comes from that. And sometimes when you're in a lesson book and you play an etude or, or something relay or an exercise, you all of a sudden discover, well, I've heard so-and-so play this on a record. And that's because that's where they got it from. Um, the first well, the first known jazz musician was a trumpet player, Buddy Bolden. And that was in the late 19th century in New Orleans. Um, he did record, but for some reason it got lost. There's only one picture of him in the, you know, in the jazz publications, jazz history books. But he was the first person to um, become known within the music. And then after him was Scott Joplin. Uh, Scott Joplin was a pianist and his style of jazz or what they call it ragtime was very closely related to classical music, very close. Um, so was Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington at first was a ragtime pianist and his music was very closely related. Um, so was Ubi Blake, um, James P. Johnson, um, you know, mostly piano players. Um, instrumentalists like trumpeters, saxophonists, clarinetists, trombonists. That didn't happen for them until sometime during the 20th century. But um, the first known saxophonist, it's actually a tie between Sidney Bechet and Coleman Hawkins. And their earliest recordings date back to 1924. Um, of course, you know, it's not without the racial overtones because Black musicians were not allowed to record until 1922. Um, and um, a, a trumpeter by the name of Freddie Keppard would have been the first to record around that time. But he was very guarded 
about his style of playing. He was very fearful that people would listen to what he's playing and steal his ideas. Mm -hmm. So that honor went to the original Dixieland Jazz Band. They were the first to record jazz. So, James, you are um, you're mentioning um, one of the themes that actually shows up in this work that David has written. Um, and so I, I want to have us explore that um, in a little bit. Um, but I want I am curious and would like to start off by asking David, what brought you to write this play? Probably about eight years ago, I was um, invited by a director friend of mine to see a play that he was directing. And it's a play that's been around now for probably 20 years. It's called The Devil's Music. I think it has a subtitle, but it's basically you spend, if you're in the audience, you spend a night uh, with Bessie Smith in her last performance. So um, there's a band, uh, there's the actor who plays Bessie Smith. And I went to see it and I really enjoyed it. Of course, I, I, I for many years had loved Bessie Smith's music. I didn't know too much about her. And after I saw the show, which I enjoyed, I did a little digging and, uh, you know, kind of like James, I, I, I have a love for history and I kind of go down my history rabbit hole. So I went down my history rabbit hole on Bessie Smith. And among the people that I found connected to her was this man named Lonnie Johnson. And, um, I'd never heard of him before. And the things I was reading were suggesting that this was a this was a pioneer of the guitar. And he did certain things on the guitar that no one had done before him. He, he played other instruments as well. He played a violin. He was just multi-talented. He wrote songs and he sang songs. And he, he kind of had his heyday in the 1920s. Um, and he sold quite a few copies of one particular record, I believe in the 1940s, called Tomorrow Night. But I was just surprised because I thought as kind of a, a music nerd, not being a player myself, but being a music nerd in terms of loving the history of music, um, how could I not have heard of this guy? So I did a little more digging and I, I, I saw that there was a Philadelphia connection. And the Philadelphia connection was that by 1959, Lonnie Johnson, who in his day was considered one of the greats, um, could no longer make a living as a musician. And some of it had to do with what uh, James was speaking of. Um, his music, as many Black artists' music had been stolen from them, bad contracts, um, contracts that were deceiving, those sorts of things. Um, but part of it is just he was an older man. He was in his late 50s at that time. Okay, that's not that old, right? But he had kind of been forgotten about. His heyday was over. And... He was working in Philadelphia. He had been invited to Philadelphia. He was he was one of this, these kind of people who, uh, I guess, musicians often are kind of nomadic. So he had lived in many different places. He lived in Peoria, Illinois. He lived, of course, in his hometown of New Orleans and um, been all over the country. But by the late 1950s, he was living in Philadelphia. He had a family and he couldn't make ends meet as a musician anymore, despite his accolades, despite his his mastery of his instrument and his enormous talent. And he was working as people do, uh, particularly a person of color at this time. He didn't have many choices, fewer choices um, than white people. And he happened to be working um, not as a musician, but he was working at the Ben Franklin Hotel and he was working there as a janitor. And a DJ, a local DJ for WHAT, who was like me, a music nerd, got a tip that, V. Lonnie Johnson, and he was being a music nerd, he knew who Lonnie Johnson was. Lonnie Johnson was working at this hotel in Philadelphia, right near the radio station. And the DJ decided he would go to see if it was the Lonnie Johnson, the one whose records he'd listened to, uh, the person who he'd idolized um, for all these years. And so he went, he met Lonnie, this is all true. And we don't know what happened between them when they first met, but in the end, Chris was able to convince Lonnie to record again. Lonnie hadn't recorded for a couple of years and nobody was really buying his records. And, and Chris said, hey, I'd love to record you. Um, you need to be appreciated. And because uh, Chris, as a DJ and as a white man, had the power at that time, um, 
he was able, he convinced Lonnie, number one, uh, to record. And they struck up a friendship. Lonnie recorded, I believe, three albums with Chris as producer, three or four. And it briefly uh, re-energized Lonnie's career. And so he did a number of tours in Europe with other blues artists like Howlin' Wolf and Sonny Boy Williams. And, and um, it was a whole new generation that by then was interested in the roots of um, what was by then kind of rock and roll music, right? Um, and so that's what interested me in the story. I was shocked that I didn't know the story before. Uh, I was curious about lo what Lonnie's response would have been, uh, you know, trying to get pulled back into something he loved, but something he thought that um, was in the rear view mirror. And um, that became the seed of a play. And so I started listening to Lonnie Johnson music a lot. And uh, I just started writing, never thinking it would be anything or never not thinking, oh, this is a play, but just imagining a dialogue between Lonnie Johnson and this younger man, Chris, who comes to see if this is the Lonnie Johnson. So that's how it all started. So in one of the themes in your, um, in the play, and that those of you that um, you're, you're stewards of history and you, and you exist and you're listening to the conversations that are even happening right now currently in our society is this kind of idea um, of, or not even an idea of this, a fact is happening where, um, especially in the music industry, where the theft of someone's art um, and the theft of the art of people of color um, have ended up ending in riches for um, someone who you're white, and um, and 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 that that theft has resulted in obscurity and and poverty, um, and we're seeing that conversation play out, you know, on TikTok and um, you know social media and all those different things. And, and so I think about, I'm curious about what what you all think about um, what needs to happen um, in the arts world. Um, that fixes the damage that was done from the theft of that art and um, the mechanism that's happening either within our culture or within us uh, that has this continue to be perpetuated um, but even now. Um, I think that a few things need to happen. Um, one, um, we can we notice that the entertainment industry is much more accessible than it had been before with social media. Um, people are making entire albums in their houses with their iPhones mm -hmm. and soundtrack. Um, and so uh, the first thing that needs to happen is uh, artists need to be um, a lot more vigilant about what their rights are about the music that they are making and how to protect it. Um, but then I also believe um, that the second thing is that uh, companies and producers and agents and things like that uh, need to be a lot more transparent about what it is that they're happening. I know that we live in this country that is a, a capitalistic structure, structure that you know it's all about making money. Um, but uh, because of our quest for money, we're missing out on history and we're missing out on art. And so if people would be more transparent about what it is that they're doing, what they need to do, but then also the artists being um, a lot more aggressive and saying like, this is mine, recording things, making sure that they have proof that things belong to them. Um, I think that's a start. It's not an end all, but I think that's definitely a start. I think that, um, and you've seen this throughout history, right? I mean, if you take the example of um, like the promenade where slave owners would would have this, this kind of ritual European sort of walk around this cake, it turned into a cake walk because, it, you know, African-Americans made fun of that. And then, and then that became a very cultural thing to bring African-Americans closer. White people took the cake walk and then they profited off of that, put it into their own style. It's like we see this repeated time and time again. One of the things that, you know, 
my uh, black mentors talk to me about is where is the origins of everything that you play? Don't claim anything as your own. I think mm. uh, just as Dr. Wilson was talking about, uh, we have a tendency in this capitalistic society that for the sake of money, we claim information as our own. Um, especially musicians do this, you know, like people in power and all we do this for the sake of ego, for the sake of chasing after success, this idea that, oh, well, because I learned it, it's mine now. And we need to be able to differentiate in whatever systemic trap we're in, whether it's education, whether it's capitalism, we got to differentiate between um, information that is that we've come up with ourselves, the origins of it, and information that we're sharing. Because I think people have done each other, especially people in power, and we know that, you know, the privileged, uh, white patriarchy, all of this that we see um, everywhere in the music industry, in sports, in entertainment, the ones with power, the ones with money are of a single color, let's be honest. <laughs> so. Uh, so in order to, to flip the script on that, it's like we'd have to have an honest sit down at the table. Where where does this information come from? Can we get back to that storytelling and that sharing and that equal ground? But it would take an entire reversal of the systems at play. Right. Thank well, you at one that. time, at one time, musicians did stand up to certain things because from 1918 until 1940, all recorded music was not given by way of royalties to the musicians. Why I, why I give that time frame? Because in 1940, musicians decided not to record. And they, that lasted for two years. It was called a recording band. And the, the industry at that time was losing money because nobody was going into the studios to do anything. By 1942, the musicians got what they wanted. They got record royalties. And that lasted until the companies got too comfortable and started taking it away. So they had another recording band in 1948 that lasted for four months. And after that, the majority of the musicians or singers or whatever, whatever, whoever is recording gets a percentage of what they've done. Now, since the 1970s, companies have expanded. You have these big companies, you have small companies. Small companies tell you right off the bat, you're not getting royalties because we can't afford to do that. But musicians accept it because they want to be seen and heard. So um, they do it. And that's why things are the way they are now. Now, back in 1995, I had a conversation in uh, Pori, Finland with Herbie Hancock because I wanted to know a few things regarding the recording in industry. And he told me something that really struck me. He said in the 1970s, he started bringing his CDs on gigs because, you know, nobody else was, was doing that at the time. And he was making more money selling CDs on gigs than he was getting royalty checks from Columbia Records at the time. Yeah. So from that point on, you know, he was one of the first to do that. A lot of people don't know that, you know, because he doesn't really talk about it. And he would he would make more money that way. And that's what musicians, for the most part, are doing now. That's because they're recording for smaller labels. But there's not many big labels nowadays. Um, Nora Jones did something that wasn't totally expected because she signed with Blue Note Records, but she signed, she did that on purpose because Blue Note was only expecting her to sell 20,000 units. She ended up selling 600,000 and she's getting paid for it still. <laughs> so, you know, you, 
you have to have a certain a certain mindset to decide if this is what you're going to do and if you intend to make recordings do you want the expectations to be big which puts a lot of pressure on you or do you want them to be small which doesn't put a lot of pressure on you and if things don't work out you know it's not a big deal so um Musicians themselves, you know, musicians, vocalists, they just have to get together and decide, you know, you know, how do I, how do I want to make it? Or if I do make it, how do I maintain it? And you have to stick to your guns because um, there's only been a few examples, like when Herbie signed with Blue Note, he insisted on having his masters. And because of his popularity as a side man, he was able to do that. Only a few artists have been able to do that. And like I said, it it takes the people who do the actual work to just get together and and, and form a bond and maintain it. Sherry, that reminds me of. Um, um, that, that reminds me that um, what James is saying reminds me of a current example, um, a pop artist, a British pop artist, uh, Kate Bush, whose song Running Up That Hill now has gone to the top of the charts after like 35 years. And as James was saying, she was able to, because she had the power at the time, to be able to own her own masters. So um, it seems like most of the pennies that are being earned from that, you know, that, that rendered interest in her song is uh, going to her, look, kind of like with Herbie Hancock, as James would say. Thank you for that. So, you know, as I was um, reading through the script and trying to, you know, prepare for tonight, I was like looking up different songs that are in it that we will have a chance to hear um, as the once the the we we get to watch and um, see the the play produce and. And I and I thought, you know, as I'm, it was creating such a mood as I'm like reading through and kind of having this experience, and um, and I was he was thinking, wow, you know, um, we use music for you know particular things. You know, there's a you have a different experience when you watch a movie and the soundtrack is is like right on point, right? Um, there's certain music that is just thought of to be the music for for dancing and Zumba. <laughs> there's um, music that helps us kind of scream into the void. And there's there's music that helps us to, you know, tell a story. You know, my dog's barking and my truck's broke down and my feet stink. You know, like just that good, good music. Um, and there's uh, so I, I thought to myself when I think about the evolution of blues and jazz. Right. Um, Dr. Wilson, you talked about, you know, that being out of, you know, church and, and that with that being for you. And um, I am curious what each of you think of what jazz and blues is used for. What does it help us express? What is it used for? Have, what, how has it been what has been it what has it been useful for for you? I think for for me, I mean, blues is you have to think after the transatlantic slave trade, where you have all of these African Americans that are working like blood, sweat, and tears under white oppression for all these years. Finally, they're emancipated in 1865, but it's not like they're suddenly granted all of these freedoms. Right. And I think that you have these wandering blues musicians that, you know, um, as the years go by, they reject minstrelsy. Um, there are these traveling tents there they are black people trying to uplift black people with the history of work songs field hollers um you know and incorporating this into this blues music um in order to just keep their fellow brother and sister uh, afloat you know and so um these these wandering blues musicians 
not only singing songs of um, sadness, but singing songs of joy as well, singing songs, because it, to me, and my point is this, it's like the blues is a reminder of expression, humanity, being able to just express you humanity at the end of the day. I mean, the, the, the crying, the wailing, and then the instruments that follow that same style, the guitar, you know, in Delta blues, having the, 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 the bottleneck in Delta and being able to like cry on the guitar, um, the way the piano is played and the way that, you know, certain musicians found ways of mimicking that on the voice. And then the African rhythms that you get from Africa that in jug blues, let's say, are played on the washboard and on the jug. And so, and so you have all of these different blues styles coming together. And then of course the great migration happening and now everybody's sharing everything from 1910 to 1970. And then you have, you know, everything, you know, uh, coming together from the cities and all that. But I think for me personally, it's a reminder to um, express and celebrate your humanity. It's, it's that idea of getting to spontaneously compose, getting to um, create something that's off of the page, getting to, um, yeah, it's the importance of, of instead of playing what's in a box, being able to kind of cry and wail out of the box. I've been told by, again, my, my teachers, my mentors, it was always play the blues, even if you're playing bebop and whatever form of jazz, it's like the blues is in there. That's true humanity that you should be expressing in everything that you do to play any piece of music, no matter what it is, like the blues, because there's honesty there. And I think that's what makes it such um, a powerful and arguably the most influential music of, of all time, you know, to me. Thank you. Uh, for me, um, blues is, is an expression of feelings that you have had and then when you play the blues, it's what you've had versus what you're having at the moment. Um, and blues, of course, has evolved into what it is today, but um, it's still a very basic form. So you have to play in a very basic way to get everyone in the audience to understand you. And that's the key word, the audience, um, because up until 1942, jazz was a dance music. And then it changed when the bebop era came along. It became sophisticated. Um, and it became too sophisticated for a large cross section of people. And the sophistication evolved even more with the avant garde in the uh, 60s and it lost it lost a whole lot of people and the smooth jazz brought it brought these people back to a certain degree but then the musicians are complaining that the music is too watered down and to a to a degree it is too watered down because it's bec it became too simple and musicians on the whole want to be able to show how intelligent they are through their music. And sometimes that music displays a high degree of intelligence. Mm -hmm. But uh, flipping back to the early days, when that was noticed, it kept black musicians down. We could, you know, black musicians at that time could only perform in bordellos, tents, somewhere outdoors. They could never perform in a concert hall up until the 1930s because, um, you know, everybody talks about the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was a speakeasy, was the biggest speakeasy in Harlem. Harlem had over 5,000 speakeasies in the 1920s and up until 1935. So, you know, and, but, you know, we see the movie Cotton Club, we look at this elegant looking place, but it was illegal. The boo, you know, the booze they were serving was illegal up until 1935, but it was allowed. 
and that was it was like that in other cities. So it's it's a it's a give and take kind of a thing, and um, to bring something else to the table, I knew the some of the last of the Lindy Hop damper dancers. I knew them personally, and they discussed with me how bebop drove them away from the music because it was too fast for them to dance to. I knew Frankie Manning and Norma Miller. Um, they were dance partners. They lived, well, they lived until the early 2000s. Well, Norma just died two years ago. But um, Frankie Manning has a book out. If you Google his name, you'll find his book. And you know, you somehow you have to relate the music to the people because they're the ones that's paying to see it. Which, and some of that money is going to you. I mean, you can be as sophisticated as you want at a place like Carnegie Hall, because they're there just to listen. But you got to have the mindset, which most, I say the majority of, or so I should say all the blues musicians do, that this music has, you know, is danceable. And that's the key word, danceable. Whereas you go to a place like the Village Vanguard, you, you can expect to hear levels of sophistication, sometimes far beyond your imagination. Mm. So jazz has become too, unfortunately jazz has become too multifaceted mm. because people pick the kind of jazz they want to listen to. Um, I have a more sociocultural perspective as it relates to jazz and blues. Um, much of the music that was created through the Black experience, either through the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery, um, what made it so special was, um, as Mike Bond had, had alluded to, like the humanity, like you are hearing and experience someone's life experience in the music. Um, but whenever I think about, you know, the blues and jazz in particular, I always think about how jazz got to this level of sophistication because the white people could play it and it could be recorded and replicated. And because of that, we lost some of the, the humanity that came with it. We lost the feeling. So that also comes from a person who specializes in Negro spirituals. Um, Negro spirituals were passed down through various uh, generations and uh, experiences. Um, and we wanted to capture, um, uh, John W. Work went to Appalachia and captured some of those songs. And when the, when the purpose of capturing the songs was to put it on paper so that people could read it and people could replicate it, it lost the, the human essence to it. And so when I hear, sometimes when I hear jazz music, you know, my first thought is, well, I don't feel it. And that's because somebody took it so that they could make something off of it. Um, mm -hmm. I feel the same way about a lot of gospel music. I feel the same way about a lot of R&B, um, but it's, it's a way that someone said, we wanna do this. And so since we wanna do it, now it's okay, it's popular because we wanna do it, as opposed to it being authentic the way that it was created. Yeah. You know, I've heard you each talk about how jazz has evolved and blues have evolved and it came from, um, I'm curious, where do you see it going from here? Where do you want it shared um, in the places that it's not? Well, uh, in my opinion, in order to keep an audience, we have to start with the kids. Mm. Um, bring it to elementary and middle schools, which has not been done much. 
Why? Because of the level of sophistication, but it can be simplified enough for them to be curious enough about it to want to check it out. Mm -hmm. So if we start with the kids, we'll have something. But that's the key word, you know, get get the younger people at least to know about it. They don't have to be interested, but at least be aware. Because there will be some that will be interested. So we have to try and get it to all of them. I agree. So there's, gener there's generations that have never, to even now, that have never heard this music. So, you know, that's what we have to start with. And I agree that there needs to be uh, accessibility for everyone. Um, so starting with children, and I think music has this very, fine, well, art in general, has this very fine line between um, catering to your audience, but then also challenging them at the same time, um, allowing you to grow as a, a creative and an artist, but also allowing your audience to grow and evolve with you. And so I think making jazz and blues accessible, um, Sometimes I want to hear jazz music that's very tonal. I actually enjoy, you know, music that has a resolution at the end of it. And, you know, too many accidentals make me anxious. So <laughs> I just I like to be able to know where it's going sometimes. Not all the time, but just sometimes. Um, and I think, um, I think if we change the way that we view jazz, um, as James Stewart talked about, like it's the level of sophistication is sometimes beyond what we can even imagine. I think if we just made it accessible, and then once we made it accessible, we can try to challenge our audiences and look to to think a little bit differently about what they hear, what they experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for the play, right? Um, so this is this is about the musician Lonnie's um, life, real who's a real person. Um, mm -hmm. Background on kind of what inspired you to write this play, and you know, play can you know only be so long, but someone's life is super super long. Right. Um, I'm curious, what's some gems uh, that we need to know about Lonnie um, that didn't make it into the play? Oh wow, uh, he had he had such a long and a varied career, and um, Cherry, as you're alluding to, that's kind of the hard thing, because on one hand, I don't want it to make it a biographical play. That wasn't really my intention. I want it to be about this moment in time. These two men in this particular room kind of navigating a connection, a potential connection. Um, you know, in the beginning of the play, for perhaps obvious reasons, based on what we've been talking about, Lonnie's a little wary of being pulled back into this, especially because this white man shows up and says, Hey, you want to record again? You know, he's heard this kind of thing before. Um, so, boy, I, I did try to shoehorn a lot in, but I couldn't get it all in. Um, boy, um, some stuff is in the play. Uh, he played with Duke Ellington. He played with Bessie Smith. I did find out later on, apparently, I don't know if this is true or not. We have no way of proving this, that uh, he and Bessie had a thing. Apparently, she had a thing with, you know, a lot of people. But, you know, hey, musicians. I don't want to assume this about musicians, so please, musicians, uh, <laughs> tell me I'm out of my mind. But okay. uh, <laughs> but um, he he was just, you know, he had a large family. He came from a family of musicians. All of the members of his family pretty much were musicians. So uh, somebody mentioned legacy early, and for Lonnie Johnson, it was a legacy, not just a legacy of music, uh, because he was a part of the Black experience but also because there was that family connection. And so it was the way for his family to connect with one another. And many of them died in the pandemic of 1918. He went to Europe for a while. He was back and forth. There are parts of his life nobody really knows much about because nobody was there recording it. Nobody was there writing it down. He had a lot of, um, he did a lot of shift work. He did a lot of work as we all do sometimes to make ends meet, but he kept coming back to the music. And it was a, a couple people, Mike and, and um, Dr. Wilson and so forth, were talking about, I think, the passion for it. 
and he just that was who he was he was a musician in his bones and uh, I don't know if I'm a writer in my bones, but one way in which I identified with Lonnie was just, he was a journeyman. He just kept at it. He just kept at it. He just kept at it. And he went out of fashion. He went in fashion. And you do get some of that in the play. But, you know, I just, he talked in one of his recordings about, you know, I had a pretty hard life, but I had a pretty good life. He kind of was able to balance the hardships he'd been through. Uh, with the joy he got from music, with the people that he met, with the experiences he had. So what did I not shoehorn into the play? Um, it's it's hard to say. There's so much. Oh, I know what I didn't. Okay, took me a while, but here I am. Um, the play takes place and it ends pretty much where it begins in terms of time period. But after this play takes place, Lonnie did go on, as I said, to record some other albums. And there was that brief resurgence and at some point, he was back on the, the touring circuit uh, by himself with other musicians. And he eventually wound up in Canada. And he really loved Canada, apparently. His family stayed in Philadelphia. But he moved at least part-time to Canada for a long time, um, toward the end of his life. Because, as he said a number of times, he just felt that he was treated better in terms of race in Canada than he was in the United States. So he felt more comfortable there. He opened up a jazz club briefly, and um, then he died. He sadly died in 1970. There was a, uh, he was walking down the street in Toronto one day where he was living, and um, a, a car went out of control on the street and ended up on the sidewalk. He happened to be on that sidewalk in him, and he did, sadly, he did not die right away. He spent about a year in the hospital um, trying to recover from his, his injuries. And he did not. And so depending on who you ask, he was either in his early 70s or late 70s. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, one of the cool things that I learned in writing this play was he has at least one child who's still alive. And after I wrote this play and I had to figure out how to get the rights to the music to be able to use it in the play. Um, I found out that she happens to live in Philadelphia and her name is Brenda and uh, she's a lovely woman. And when the play was first produced uh, in this March, this past March, I had a chance to meet her. And it was for me a huge moment because I'm like, talk about it's like one. What is it? The uh, six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. Right. This old game. Uh, there's one degree from Lonnie Johnson. And she was very young when he died. So she didn't get to know him all that well. And um, it was kind of this woo-woo moment. And I'm not a woo-woo person where she sat in the audience watching someone portray her father who had died so long ago and playing his music. And it was just, I found a very moving experience. So that is not in the play. Uh, maybe it should be, but that does, that's not in the world of the play, what happened to him after this play. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I without giving too much away, because. Everyone, you have to go see the see the play. It's going to be fabulous. Um, there so rehearsing is... as we speak, Cherry. As we speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I noticed that there was this wrestling of a converse within the play uh, between the characters that is part of a conversation that's happening in our society currently about who can tell whose story. Um, and specifically as it breaks down around racial lines, is it appropriate for someone white to be telling the story of someone who is, is African-American, not white? Just given all the history, and we talked earlier about how you know, art has been stolen and whatnot. So I am, I'm curious about, um, did that make it into the play because of the times we're in? Or are you, have you, did you wrestle with whether it was right for you to write this play, to tell the story? And Yes and yes. Although it's interesting you say that because when I first was inspired to write it, that didn't really cross my mind. Uh, and perhaps it should have. Um, Lonnie Johnson's experience is not my experience uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. He was from a very different generation. Um, he is a person of color. I'm not. Um, he's a musician, as I mentioned. I'm not. 
Um, and so I wrestled with it, but I didn't wrestle with it for too long because and people will have different views and I'd love to hear them. Um, to me, the writer's job is to bring respect to the subject matter mm -hmm. and as much empathy for the characters as possible. And so uh, I, I don't know if I'm good at it, but I, I feel like I have a facility for both of those things. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think that, you know, no one is any one thing. Um, I can relate to Lonnie and the fact that he was a father. I can relate to Ronnie, uh, sorry, Lonnie, and by the fact that he struggled in his life, uh, that he was a married man. In his case, he was married a couple of times. I've only been married once so far. Um, uh, so even though I, 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 have, I cannot say that I've ever lived anyone else's experience but my own, um, I also know that in my view, it's the artist's job to imagine. And sometimes that means imagining beyond your immediate experience. Um, because to me, that's what art is supposed to be about. Empathy, imagination, mm. respect, maybe sometimes not respect. In the case of Lonnie Johnson, enormous amount of respect. I think it depends on the subject matter. Mm. Um, so uh, I wrestled with it, but for me, not long. I, I've written plays with white characters, with, with black characters, with Asian characters, with male characters, with female characters, uh, with children, with adults. And um, <laughs> I, I guess I, I consider myself relatively boring. And so honestly, I have no desire to write about myself. <laughs> Just to me, part of writing is about asking questions. Yeah. And some of the questions that I ask about myself end up in plays, even if the play is about someone who on the surface might seem very different from me. The play is always about the writer on some level. Um, I don't I'd be curious to hear what musicians think about them. So, so, so let me ask the question in this, in this way for our musicians that, and, um, that are here. Um, when you think about how we're, cu we're currently wrestling with this question about, you know, who presents the story and how that shows up with authenticity, um, um, with respect, with empathy, with the way that story should be told, um, what is it that you all look for? Um, and what do you all think about, um, about what this question that we're wrestling with? Well, um, in my perspective, um, I saw the movie Bird, and it um, more or less emphasized his drug use, his being not so dependable, things like that. But um, a couple of years after that movie came out, I was at a jazz show, and I run into Slide Hampton, trombonist. And, um, he mentioned, he said, if it weren't for Charlie Parker, nobody would have ever heard of him. And I asked him, well, why is that? And he said he was in Harlem with his, with his trombone, you know, in the case, waiting to catch a bus. He said, mm -hmm. Charlie Parker came out of a building, saw him, asked him, was he a musician? He said, yes. He said, well, come with me. They get into a cab. Bird takes him to every club on 52nd Street, tells the club owners his name, said, this is, this is you know, he said, he said this is Slide Hampton, hire him for some gig because he's new in town. And Slide, he said, the phone rang the next day. Four of those clubs asked him to come play there. And he said, Charlie Parker never even heard him play. He assumed that he could. Wow. And he asked for it. He said, you, you've never even heard me play. How, how do you know that I could, you know, play the music? Burr said, well, it was the way you were standing on the bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, that was another side of him that a lot of people, if they hadn't talked to people that knew him, and I spoke to a lot of people that knew him, he was that way. Mm -hmm. Frank Foster told me the same story. He said, uh, when he was on, on a break with the Basie Band and needed gigs, said Charlie Parker came to him and said you need some work 
And Frank said, yeah, of course I need some work. So he took him down to 52nd Street, asked people to hire him, and they did. But that's never mentioned, you know, unless you, you know, unless you run into somebody that uh that knew him. Right. And that was in fact, that was well known among a lot of musicians. Of course, most of them are gone now, you know. As I'm older, I'm in my, you know, I'm in my mid-60s. But mm -hmm. you know, I I knew a lot of these people that knew Charlie Parker. And that really made me have bad feel even more bad feelings about the movie because nobody you know dug deep enough to find all this out yeah yeah i think also it's in that same vein yes yeah, honesty i think it's all about being honest i get mad when i hear some of my vocal students try to riff and you can tell they're doing it to impress versus mm -hmm. like do you know where this comes from do you know who bessie smith is do you mm -hmm. know who Ma rainy is like do you, have you listened to the blues like do you i tell them straight up to my students it's like you better be reaching for black blood in the soil and i'm an asian guy and so i say that with all respect playing black music means i have to know where this music comes from so otherwise it just sounds like and again this could be kind of harsh and i know it's being recorded but it sounds like auditory blackface it sounds like you, just like what we talk about in history it sounds like people are just taking black art and trying to use it to promote themselves and their own egos and their individual you know instead of actually like doing it to create uh, an information sharing sort of world and I think for me, in my brain, it's like, are we creating this music and, and, and going with the, uh, with the stream of capitalism? Are we doing it in order to make money? Are we doing it in order to promote ourselves? Are we doing it to share this art form with everybody, paying homage to where it really comes from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, black culture, black music. So to me, to, to me that distinction is really, really important um, mm. and and I think that if you're working on the side of truth for the collective whole mm. then that's good regardless of what color you are because you're you know where the origins of this is if you're if you're doing it primarily just to promote yourself then that's that's something else and so there's a respect there and you could hear it I think as a musician you could hear it in people's playing <laughs> you know um, <laughs> Yeah. So, and I um, I would like to add to that because I agree with everyone. Um, uh, I said in my dissertation that in this age of social justice and like what that really looks like, um, I'm very adamant in believing that we are not going to sing our way into equity. We are not going to <laughs> sing kumbaya and. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't I know Beast Pacham into the right way? Um, it's going to take more than hard conversations. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to take praxis or, or, or uh, action to move mm -hmm. past that, right? And so I think doing, uh, having art like this allows that to happen. Um, knowing that uh, David had the resources and the talent and the ability uh, to create uh, this play on a life that a lot of people would not know about. If he didn't do the play, we would never know about it. <laughs> and so, as I stated, a lot of the history in black uh, culture is oftentimes passed down through oral tradition. And so we miss out on a lot of art and a lot of history because those people died without their stories being recorded. And so I think we should move past, yes, we should, should struggle with, you know, should people be doing this, but what do we want the outcome to be? We want to know this person's history because it's important. Mm -hmm. And so if it's black, white, yellow, green, purple, whatever, we need this story to be recorded. Now, with that being said, we want authenticity to be the history that we hear about. You know, the history is often told by the oppressor and never the oppressed. 
So you want to make sure that you are hearing the story in its most authentic form. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? Get uh, people that know the person, family members, friends, and things like that. So as James Stewart said, you know, he saw a movie on Charlie Parker that talked about only one side of this person's life that was antithetical to who he knew him as a person. Mm -hmm. And so you want to bring uh, an authentic voice with the privilege that comes with having the resources, having the color, having the talent uh, to create the art. And what's wonderful about what you were just saying is that one of the things that theater allows us to do, and I feel very lucky uh, in this way because the team on this play is just fantastic, is it's a bunch of different people from different backgrounds, from different experiences. Our director, Ozzy, is a musician. It's funny, the second time this play has been produced, both directors have also been musicians. And so they were able to bring, I think they are able to bring, uh, this level of authenticity that as a non-musician, I can't. I can piece a story together. I can try to tell it as well as I can. Um, but oh my gosh, just having two directors who are both musicians was like, how did I luck out? Because what I've dreamed for this play is that, as just about everyone said, that we learn more about this person, that the story carries you forward in an interesting way, that it it engages these issues that are as current now as they were 50 years ago, uh, if not more. I don't know, could they be more? But I've been a, but theater has been a wonderful um way to tell the story. I mean, you could tell it in a movie, you could tell it in a, in a storybook. But what's great about theater is I get to collaborate with all these talented people who then bring their own experience to it. Um, well, we have two mus three musicians in the cast. You know, we have two musicians in the cast, one who's the director. And oh my gosh, I'm learning so much from them just about, you know, they were talking about slide guitars the other day. I just kind of sit there and I'm like, Tell me more about slide guitars. So I'm just kind of soaking it up like a sponge and it's just been a real pleasure. So um, the collaboration is just, oh, it's what it's all about. It's just wonderful. We wanna uh, take some questions from our audience. Um, so if you are um, in the audience and you are interested in asking these fine gentlemen something, please uh, go ahead and, and type your question into the Q&A uh, box. I will read it out and we will um, have them answer. Uh, so the first question comes from Jay. Um, and Jay's asking, who says blues is not sophisticated and why? Is any blues sophisticated? Yes, yes there's some blues that's sophisticated. Um, you just have to figure out Who's playing it? I, mean, I remember Branford Marcellus made a whole CD based on the blues. And some of it was simple and some of it was sophisticated. The CD is called I Heard You Twice the First Time. <laughs> I love that. I heard you twice the first time. Yeah, blues is a form that you can, I mean, yes, when we look at the origin of the blues, maybe the form is simple. But as like the blues, that 12 bar form, people um, with, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, like people took that form and they changed it. They, you have 16 bar blues and then you have blues with a bridge in it. And then you have, you know, and so it, it kind of, people did with it what they will, as is the nature. People challenged the original form, um, musicians like Branford, and like you know ex expanded it or you know so are there are there other questions for the panelists well i have another question um so I grew up with blues in my household. My father played, um, you know, uh, we would, you know, uh, he had a you know, record player and we would blast that that music. And, you know, uh, 
you know, there are times were hard in the house and, you know, my, my dad's up really super late playing that music really late. You could tell what was happening with the temperature in my house based on what was playing and who was playing. Um, you know, I have two girls um, and um, have, you know, played some, you know, blues, but then uh, some jazz, but, you know, not a huge amount. I, um, and I'm thinking, uh, this might be something I need to expand um, for them um, and their education in this music as this expression with this deep, rich history um, in the way that I got to be immersed in it and just experience it, not know that it was a thing because it just was around all the time. So now if I am going to step into uh, experiencing more of this and, and, and sharing and educating uh, my girls, What's my playlist need to look like? Um, I would say, and this is just an opinion, but you know how they say there are like all these different types of blues. You have Delta blues, you have um, jump blues as they call it, Chicago blues. There is a like a historical order from one blues to another, at least in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, you start, like, if you wanted to do a playlist and you wanted to be historical about it, which is what I liked to do as a musician to really learn it, is, you know, I might start with Delta and, you know, because Delta is the origin. Then I might go to the Louisiana blues and, you know, people in the Delta, you know, the Delta blues and that Louisiana blues, like, I know musicians that fight about the origin because, you know, <laughs> one says it came from, you know, our region. The other says it came from even W.C. Handy, who's considered the, the father of the blues because he made it popular. He said he heard it on a train in what, 1903 or something like that. He heard somebody else play it because they were using a knife and they were they were, you know, playing with the strings and doing the bottleneck thing that was popular popularized in that style we know that these blues musicians these modern musicians after 18 you know 65 and in the late um 1800s like you know they were around their stories just weren't told so i don't know i would start with delta and louisiana and then maybe i'd go to memphis and then you know that jump blues and the boogie woogie stuff that happened in the 30s and the 40s like you had the swing era that was happening in the 20s and then you have like you know jump blues boogie woogie 30s and 40s and so I, there's a chronological order that is to me interesting because due to the great migration you have these blues artists going to different cities um and sharing styles so then you kill two birds with one stone you have them listening to all this music and there's also historical sort of thing where it's like oh yeah i recognize that sound and okay. i hear that influence and so that's it's, fun. it's funny i love mike's idea of the chronology because it's so important to be able to put things in context and uh, my mind kind of works that way sometimes and then other times i get into one rabbit hole and that leads to another rabbit hole and then i kind of find my way around you know what i mean so i probably was more familiar with jazz before i was blues even though blues came first and then I had to kind of build my way back. Okay, where did this come from? And so you, you kind of create this spider web over time. This connects to this and this connects to this. And that's often the way I do it, just because I like to stumble upon things. Uh, you're always going to be surprised, I suppose. <clears throat> but um, I just love to be surprised. So it's like Bessie Smith led me to Lonnie Johnson, who led me to, I knew about Robert Johnson, but I didn't know that Lonnie Johnson actually taught Robert Johnson how to play the guitar. So it becomes all this stuff and i just love that kind of cherry picking idea um but that's maybe just because my mind works that way but chron chronology is awesome too Excellent. yeah i think mike's perspective perspective is probably the best one to go by um, from a chronological order that way you know how the tree grew as they say oh i like that any wisdom to add, Dr. Wilson? What they say. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we have another uh, question 
um, from our audience. Our audience would be curious to know the, uh, when James will be playing locally again. Um, I'm at the Candlelight Lounge on Christmas Eve. Ooh. So if you have nothing else to do, you can come down and check me out there. So that, place, so that place is hopping. I, I was over there the other night for the, uh, the, the passage event and I was like, I live in Wilmington, Delaware. So I'm like, oh my God, this place is fantastic. And it was just, it was just wonderful. What a great venue. Yes, it's, it's, it's been having jazz since the late 70s. Wow. And uh, I've been playing there quite a bit since then, since I'm, you know, since I live in Trenton. And of course, there were times when I've had Mike Bond with me. That was a, that was a great experience for both of us. I realize that it's the kind of, I'm not a bar fly, but it's the kind of place I think that could make me a bar fly. Great music, good drinks. I can just imagine sitting there and listening to the great music. So it's awesome. Well, it's a lot like some of the New York places, only, you know, it's a lot cheaper and it's uh, uh, more of a convenience for those that don't want to feel like paying for gas and tolls to go all the way to New York or <laughs> right. go all the way down to Philadelphia. Yeah, sounds pretty good. It's a special place because a lot of the musicians, the older musicians have said there's a spirit there at the candlelight that reminds them of, you know, when the audiences in jazz music were more participatory and less like, hmm, what do you got? Well, musicians, <laughs> but right. these audiences, they know the music and they participate and they're, they're like, they're part of the band. Um, and so they say that the spirit of the music has gotten lost, just similar to what we said at the beginning of this panel. The spirit of the music gets lost in the sophistication or that idea of like what you got, as opposed to like, this is all of us together. Candlelight is one of the few rare places that I've played at. And I've played at a bunch of different places in the US, but this is one of the clubs that really has that spirit there. So if you can't find the QA uh, part of in your tray, you can raise your hand. And we do have uh, one of our audience members that's raised their hand. So uh, Brishan is going to uh, unmute them so they can ask you all your question. Mona, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, can you all hear me? Can. OK. Yeah. Um, Hello, hello to all of you. And um, this has just been so wonderful and um, just um, an amazing, I'm learning a lot tonight, so thank you. So, you know, with a lot of arts programs across the country, you know, being cut a lot in, in our schools, um, I'm just wondering, especially in the music department, how do we, how do we, since blues is pretty much, I guess you would say the, the grandparent, if you will, of, of a lot of the, the, the music genre and, and so affluent in all of the music that we hear today, how do we, what can we do to, to get you know, the blues played in school or taught in a lot of the schools? Because, I mean, I took music class in, in middle school, I took piano and I wish I would have stayed with it. I probably, be up there at the candlelight lounge now playing who knows <laughs> <laughs> right um but i've never heard blues taught in school when i was growing up at all so just wondering you know what can we do to introduce it if it's not being introduced if it's not being taught or studied in like middle school and high school because what you know with some of the music that's being taught today well it may be a challenge, but um, nothing really comes through without parental involvement. Mm -hmm. And as, if more and more parents got involved and demanded what these schools should have, they're going to have to bow down and do it. Um, that's been done in Jersey City lately. Um, they've had a lot of jazz programs in their schools and blues programs. I went to college in Jersey City, and uh, even back then, it was it was going on. 
-hmm. And it's still going on now. And I, I graduated from college in 1980. That, that says a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Mia. great question. Thank you. So we've got two more questions in the chat and then we're gonna close up. Um, so one is, can anyone recommend any up and coming musicians? Um, currently, um, there's a saxophonist from Philadelphia, um, Emmanuel Wilkins, you can check him out. He's very young. He just he just got out of Juilliard School of Music. Um, I've dealt with him a few times because I'm currently a member of the Sun Ra Orchestra, and uh, we had him as a special guest at the Clef Club back when he was 16. And he's he's a strong player, up and coming. Um, then there's Camille Thurman who's a, actually a double threat. She can not, she not only can play the saxophone, but she's a great singer. And she sings and plays. She's got three CDs out so far. She was a member of the Lincoln Center Orchestra for two years because of the absence of Walter Blanding. Um, went and invited her to be a part of the band. And it, it was a springboard for her career. Um, she's a great person very humble, very unassuming. But when she gets on stage, that all changes. Yeah, Camille Thurman, I, I would recommend those two. Excellent. I know for a trumpet trumpet player, Gibson Jelen is some, someone to check out, definitely on trumpet. He's a young guy that, you know, was mentored by the great um, Roy Hargrove that passed away a few years ago. And uh, he's a great player, so. Well, oh, speaking of trumpet players, the son of Wallace Roney, uh, Wallace Roney Jr., he's another one. up and coming, great trumpet player. I knew, well, uh, I knew Wallace. I, I don't know his son yet, but um, I've heard him. Great trumpet player. And our last question is, we've got an audience member um, who would like you all to talk a little bit more about the Candlelight's history because it's such a special place. Um, I started playing the Candlelight in 1977. I was 20 years old. And back then, it was catering to both jazz and funk bands, and I was a part of both. By the 80s, it began a slow transition into jazz, but then there were um, reggae bands playing there in the 80s too. So it wasn't until the 90s when they became fully committed to jazz um, and blues, because there's a blues jam session there on Thursday nights from uh, 6 to 10. And, you know, there's mostly blues musicians that come there to jam and, you know, a few jazz musicians too, but it's a mo mostly a blues night on Thursday and jazz is there from 3.30 to 7.30 p.m. on Saturdays. Uh, it's a $20 color cover charge for the music, but then, you know, you get a buffet in between two sets after the first set is various salads and after the second set um the main course whatever the owner's wife um valerie mickelwain bradley whatever she decides to cook the whatever she does cook everybody likes so that's a big draw too yeah and again i'll, I'll be there on christmas eve i'm i'm bringing back something that I've experienced when I was a teenager, the two uh, tenor saxophone bands. Because when I was a teenager, I got to see Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons play together. So I'm bringing a Newark jazz icon to the candlelight. His name is Gene Gee. He's in his uh, mid seventies, but he does, he sounds, he still sounds like he's in his thirties. So that's what's happening Christmas Eve. Excellent. 
Well, the Candlelight, uh, Candlelight Events is a special partner uh, with Passage Theater for this particular production. Um, so you heard they have open mic um, and jams every Thursday, covers $5, and on Saturday, which includes the amazing buffet, um, is $20. Um, it's located at 26 Passaic Street in Trenton. Um, so please uh, go there and treat yourself um, and experience um, jazz and blues live here in the city of Trenton. And um, if you go uh, for this particular um, play, um, the Candlelight patrons will receive a discount code for Blues In My Soul, 20% off. So it's a treat, treat, win-win, excellent moment um, for us all to be able to get together. Oh, so I'm sorry, 24 Passaic Street. Okay. Um, so I want to thank absolutely everybody for coming out and spending this evening in the conversation um, with um, with our amazing panelists and learning and sharing and all those those good details. And I will be looking forward to seeing each of you um, for blues in my soul. Have a good night. Be careful as you walk, uh, you travel down to your your bedrooms and living rooms. <laughs> Thank you. Safe travels, everyone. Good night. Hi. Good night. Mm-hmm.